Welcome everybody to our webinar session. We are very excited about having you today. We will start soon, but first we will mention some points related to the organization. Your microphone is now on mute. We will use this feature as it is to provide an organized session to avoid background noise and interruptions during the presentation. However, we have a messenger option. In the bottom of the screen, you will see an icon. You can submit written questions by typing them in the question box in your control panel. We would like to have an interactive session and discussion, so please feel free to send your questions. You may send them at any time and we will collect and address them at the end of the presentation. In case the presentation takes longer, we will extend the session 15 minutes so we can discuss your questions. You will be able to count with the presentation that will be shown during the conference. It will be sent by email on PDF right afterwards. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Nora Lardies has a PhD in chemistry by the University of Zaragoza. She is working in AIM Plus as researcher since 2009. She has wide experience in technical assistance, evaluation and processing technologies of composite materials optimization of techniques, development of new materials, and improvement of properties. Luis Roca holds a chemical degree by the University of Valencia. He's working in AMPLA since 2000, first in injection molding and extrusion, and a few years later in the compounding department. He's involved in research and development projects and technical consulting with companies at national and international level in topics like polymer stabilization, nanomaterials, electrical and thermal conductivity, or recycling and bioplastics. Since this year, he, he leads the group of mechanical recycling. Regarding Bible Consulting, the company was founded in 1999. Over the years, Bible gathered an international team of experts and established a large professional network involving researchers, decision makers, and authorities. In addition, Bible dishes a comprehensive free monthly newsletter on tire recycling and pyrolysis, which relates to all aspects of these industries and provide unique takes on the newest developments and trends. We hope you enjoy this session. Luis and Nora, please, whenever you want. Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, okay, first of all, we are going to divide the presentation in two parts. I'm Luis, uh, and I will start the presentation. And afterwards, my, my colleague Nora will, will keep uh, with, the, with her part. Okay, uh, to begin, first of all, I want to thank Weibo for giving us the chance of uh, giving this presentation. Uh, we know that we have a lot of uh, a lot of audience, and uh, that's nice to, to, to show and to share uh, our knowledge with uh, with uh, such amount of people. Well, going to the presentation, uh, holistic approach to the recycling of end of life tires. It's very very great uh, title, but uh, the issue that we want to, uh, to 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 explain is that in this presentation we are going to show the most of the possibilities that we can take. Uh, from uh, the recycling uh, of tires, so that we don't want to lose any 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 point for recycling. That's why we uh, have uh, mentioned holistic in the title. So we are going to talk about mechanical and also chemical recycling. Okay, so let's go to the to the to the outline of the presentation. Okay. Uh, it looks that. Okay, right now. Well, uh, the contents will be uh, the following. We will introduce a little bit uh, our company, Plus. Afterwards, we will talk a little bit also about the ties and circular economy, which is a concept that nowadays is uh, quite uh, struggling very, very, very hard in the whole of the world. 
uh, we will we will uh, uh, explain our approaches for recycling from the point of view of, uh, of mechanical uh, uh, recycling. This part of the speech will be given by me. And this part, the following chemical recycling, will be given by my colleague uh, Nora. And afterwards, we are not going to be so much original. We will finish with some conclusions. Well, uh, let's start. Okay, first of all, who is Enplas uh, and, and what do we do? Okay, Enplas is a plastic resource center which is located in Valencia. Here in the left side, um, you can see where we are located. We are located, uh, if we look to Barcelona, I think most of you will know, we, we do have to drive following the coast 350 kilometers. And if you go to Madrid, which is in the right middle, in the middle of Spain, you can drive or flight or whatever. <laughs> To the, to the east and you will arrive to Valencia. Uh, we are a plastic research center, as I said, with almost 30 years of experience. And nowadays we are more than 170 people fully dedicated to plastics and uh, covering all the chain value. When I say plastics, we talk about thermoplastics, we talk about rubber, and we talk about thermoset resins. Uh, we have, uh, nowadays I think that we, we have a new building and probably we will have over uh, 11,000 square meters and a lot of pilot plants and facilities. Of course, you are invited to visit us because that's the way that you can that you can check uh, all all of uh, our uh, facilities, labs, and so on. And this is the figures of the of the institute. Uh, we have the most important thing I think is the number of customers and also the associated companies that are working with us with some discounts. And I mentioned before that we cover all the chain value from polymer synthesis. We also are able to polymerize and generate polymer by ourselves. Uh, working with raw materials, of course, compounding for modification, manufacturing and processing, end users in terms of uh, product assessment and also recovery of plastic waste. So that's how we close the loop in this uh, circular way of watching plastics. Okay, uh, let's go to the uh, to the part related with the the presentation itself. Well, I think that this is a very shocking picture I put because, uh, especially in my country in Spain, we can find things like that. This is nothing to be proud, but uh, but this is something that used to happen. Here, what we can see is a huge amount of waste, but at the same time, we can see also a huge amount of resources. Okay, uh, here I show. I put this. Sorry, I put this. Uh, this slide and this picture on the right side, where we can we can see funny ways of taking profit of of tiles. But okay, if we go to more industrial applications, so we can see that uh, tiles are very complicated. Uh, let's say products and items. So. From that point, or from that uh, point of view, we can uh, take this as some profit. Okay. Just to remind remind you, but I think that all, all of you will be quite aware of the problem. Uh, according to the European Tire Recycling uh, uh, Tires uh, Manufacturer Association, uh, in 2016, uh, were generated only in Europe uh, almost four ma four million. Uh, end of life tires, which is a huge number. It's amount of materials that are sent to somewhere and that, uh, that, that generates a very huge problem in terms of, uh, of visual contamination and also as a vector of diseases. You know that the tires used to be the, the perfect uh, place for uh, growing pests, for instance, mosquitoes and so on. And, and, it, and mainly because of the climate change, we can have a huge problem with that. Uh, as I mentioned before, and we look to the right side picture, we will we, we'll realize that that uh, that tires include a lot of products for the manufacturing. You know, um, when do, when we recycle, we can obtain reclaimed rubbers, shredded tires, ground and powdered rubber in different granulometry or particle size. This is something that can be modified depending on the final application. We also can obtain char, or steel cords, textiles, and so on. So we have a some kind of mind in, in, in that, in that, uh, with that material. So it's something that we have to take profit. Also, we can take different, it, it's very sensitive. 
Also, we can take uh, other strategies for recovering uh, uh, goods from, from end of life trials. So one of them is, is the, uh, the energy recovery or biology. So even from that, we can obtain raw materials. One of them is carbon black, which is a good example. And afterwards, I will show you uh, what we can do with that. So based on that slide, uh, my presentation will will cover all the materials or all the raw materials that we can obtain from uh, the end of life tires. One, it has been, uh, let's say, at least free treat uh, and separate all these uh, raw materials and what we can do with that. I will show you different examples that we have made in N plus. And from that, you can have some idea of what to do or how to face new projects and, and so on, okay? Okay, mechanical recycling approach. Here, uh, we I have divided in the different in the different uh, raw materials. One of the raw materials that we can obtain, not from all the tires, but different types of tires. I have to underline that I'm not expert on tires composition, but I knew a little bit. I know a little bit about that. So one of them is nylon. Nylon, as you know, is a thermoplastic with very nice uh, properties, uh, technical polymer. So uh, here uh, you can see uh, the ground uh, nylon that we can obtain from the recovery or from the, from the recycling of, of, uh, of end of life tires. So this type of uh, nylon is not a nylon that we are very used to show that is normally in form of pellets or in form of uh, fabrics. So we need to modify this, this nylon because, because of, the, of the use of the tires, you can have degradations, thermal degradation, mechanical degradation, and also uh, chemical degradation because of the, of the UV light and so on. So uh, the main problem is that this, this nylon has uh, probably a lower molecular weight than the nylon that was uh, manufactured for, for, for producing the tire. So what we can do here is uh, uh, what is called chain extension of, of nylon by means of reactive extrusion. We can add different additives, what are called chain extenders, to enlarge the molecular weight of the, of the polyamides and to recover the properties. And afterwards, to use, I think that is very challenging to, to obtain that kind of fabric that you can see in the, in the right side of this map. But anyway, uh, we can recover very well the properties and it can, it can be used uh, for different applications. Here and down, you can see in this table, uh, one example that we made with uh, with the ground polyamide with glass fiber. You can see in the first row uh, the properties of the ground polyamide, recycled polyamide with glass fiber. And uh, as we add the chain extender, you can see the improvement in the mechanical properties in the young modulus, in the flexural strength, and also uh, keeping uh, improving properties, which is related with uh, stiffness. And at the same time, keeping impact strength, which is related with toughness, in very um, very decent value. So, uh, chain extenders are not so much uh, used in the world of plastics; are quite unknown uh, additives, but are very effective when we try to recover properties in polymers like polyamide. And this could be one example. But okay, you will say, okay, Louis, but that's that's okay. It looks that it's interesting, but. Uh, you have have uh, have shown in in this in this picture that polyamide six uh, is a little bit dirty. So what we can do with that? So we can uh, do filtering and also the volatilization. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing that is that we are going to do in twin screw extruder. So uh, I think that most of you will know the technology, and we can do different processes at the same time. Okay, at the same time that we are recovering the molecular weight. We can do the volatilization and we can do filtering. So we are doing three operations that will improve quality of polyamide in one step. It makes that it's very, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, the cost, is very attractive. I think that this is a process very, very productive. So this is something that we have to also to take into account. We are not going to do different steps and so on. We can do it at the same time. Okay, and what is the volatilization about? Okay, the volatilization is a process when we are using the extruder as some kind of uh, uh, structure of volatiles that can be trapped in the in the polymeric matrix. Okay, because of the use, because of the degradation, because of the recycling and the contact with the rubber, uh, polyamide can absorb different volatiles. 
that can, of course, afterwards, when we recycle this, poly this polyamide, be volatilized because of the mobility that they can have in the polymeric matrix can be released. And okay, okay, depending on probably these others are not so much pleasant. So one way of giving more, uh, let's say, market opportunities is to remove this volatile. So we make pass through the extruder. Here you can see the extruder. Uh, and, and here you can see different venting ports. So once the material is melted, uh, we can put here those venting ports and at the same time we can uh, put uh, vacuum pumps to increase the, the volatilization of this polymer. Uh, at the same time, what we can do to enhance the volatilization is to add, add uh, different stripping agents. In this case, could be supercritical CO2, could be water vapor, or depending on the polymer, in this case, water will, will not be so much uh, attractive for polyamides. Uh, we can add, for, for example, low boiling point solvents uh, that can act as some kind of uh, scavengers of odor. Then we can remove these uh, unpleasant odors and improve the quality of the polyamide. Okay, but at the same time that we are doing that, as I mentioned before, we also can uh, filter uh, the, the, uh, the polyamide in order to retain the small rubbery particles that, that can be uh, in, the, in, in this kind of net of, of, of textile that, that came from the recycling and from the grounding. So uh, the technologies for filtering are very advanced in extrusion, so we don't have to go further. This is possible to have automatic uh, screen changes when you will obtain a very important uh, ratios of filtering and, and, and the quality of the material can be can be also interesting. Here, I didn't put it, but at the same time or prior to that, we can do a cleaning in bath. And then if we clean in a bath, we also can separate for density and also we can remove a lot of particles. So we will improve even more the quality of the polyamides that we are going to recycle. Okay, uh, one approach that, uh, that it's interesting uh, is where we have uh, ground rubber. Uh, we know that the rubber uh, has very good properties uh, in terms of, of, of toughness. So depending on the final product that we are going to obtain, we can introduce this, uh, this ground rubber as filler in, uh, in, different, in different compounds. Uh, normally what we have is uh, here in the, in the left side, you can see uh, the ground uh, rubber that we obtain in some project. And what we did in yeah, that case is uh, we mix it. Uh, besides sintering, that we also do sintering by, by hot plating press and different uh, curing agents, uh, we also do uh, uh, compounds. Different compounds with some uh, elastomer that you can see here called Prene 487. And uh, we, we make different compounds at different percentages. Uh, to obtain always a plastic that could be uh, inject molded. Okay, uh, the issue is to make plastic uh, uh, shoe soles. I cannot show you because it's a private project, so I cannot show you uh, the design and so on. Because we we have uh, yeah uh, NDA agreements that we have to, to obtain. That's what I have been allowed to show you. So uh, compounding will be performed with planetary roll extruder, but other extruders could be applied for for this purpose that uh, at that case, because of the mill flow index, it was quite uh, quite interesting to, to obtain those, those compounds. And, and what, we, what we work is uh, formulas when we try to, to reach the highest percentage of, uh, of uh, ground rubber. So we reach percentages up to uh, 75, 80%. Here in the left, you can see which is the uh, and the, appearance, the appearance and the appearance was quite good. And uh, afterwards, we inject uh, the, the soles of, of the shoes, and, uh, and the company was uh, quite happy with that. Which is not so. <laughs> sometimes, when you are doing research, it's not it's not that easy. And we obtain different uh, values in mechanical properties that uh, that were okay were the requirements of of the of the costume. This is another approach. Okay. And uh, another one is uh, based on the, on, the, on the byproducts of pyrolysis. In this case, carbon black. Here you have a, a sample of carbon black uh, by pyrolysis. 
And uh, as you know, uh, Cabo Black is one of the fillers already is more employed in plastics, also in rollers. Uh, we can obtain color reinforcement, uh, UV protection, and identity effect. Also, we can obtain uh, or we can improve thermal properties in terms of thermal stabilization. Uh, I didn't put, but uh, we can obtain at the same time. Uh, but anyway, uh, depending on, uh, on uh, okay, of course, we can obtain good properties, but it will depend strongly from the dispersion of the of this carbon black in the polymer matrix or in the in the rubber the rubber matrix. Otherwise, we are not going to to have good properties. And at the same time, we need, for instance, to over uh, over formulate, which is much expensive. So in that case, in that study, what we did is to compare the performance of uh, this uh, uh, recycled carbon black with uh, uh, commercial carbon black that we can have in the market. And what we did in the, in, the, in the work that I'm going to show you right now is to compare the coloring capacity of both carbon blacks. To do that, what we, what we suggest is to check how it works in some thick parts. You know that when we have injection molding, we, we can have thick parts with, uh, I think, that probably two, three, or even four millimeters, okay? Uh, but at the same time, we want to check if this uh, tinting capacity is the same in very thin uh, items, which is a film uh, that is very uh, related or that, ha that can have much a strong influence on dispersion. Because you know that if you have something of few microns, dispersion will be much more uh, important to be, to be achieved in unlike uh, very or thicker parts. That, uh, that we have in injection. So uh, we need, uh, and, and, and what we try to do is uh, how to uh, how to disperse this recycled carbon black in order to not modify the normal processing of people that was working dispersing the conventional one. But here is been a mistake on the animation. Sorry. So what we did is to be to do a benchmark as I show you. And, uh, and we and we were uh, comparing the tinting capacity of both carbon blacks. Uh, both techniques, injection molding and extrusion, and well, this is very, very sensitive, so I will go back once again. Sorry. Another one. I don't know why. Okay, and and the structure of the of the work that we that we did was the one that you have uh, here. You know that uh, down in the slide. You know that most of times when you are working with plastics or with uh, polymers, you need to add additives in in in, in form of master batch, which is a concentrate that can have additives, uh, pigments, and so on. In this case, we have carbon black. What we do is afterwards we do a dilution in injection molding and extrusion. And we make dispersion measures. I have uh, skipped this because we 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 were we don't have so much time. But anyway, those dispersion measures that for us are very important. I always recommend to make dispersion measurements. Anything that you were mixing, I don't care about. If you are mixing plastics, if you are mixing uh, uh, thermal settings, or if you are mixing uh, rubber with anything, I think the dispersion will give you a view of and a guide for the quality of your product. From that dispersion, we select what type of master batch was the most appropriate, and afterwards, we did the color measurements. So the process, as I mentioned, was uh, the compounding was made in a twin screw extruder, uh, corrotating twin screw extruder. OK, of course, uh, as we are a plastic research center, we work with machines that are pilot plant um, size, but we also can export this these things because we have enough knowledge and also we have simulation software to do uh, a scale up uh, at the machine that that was uh, in the in the in the customer facilities um, of course we we designed the screw appropriate for the dispersion of this of this material and from that we obtain different samples you can see here on the right side down uh, samples of the master batch that we obtain, and, uh, and of course we work at 40 percent uh, of carbon black, and we have a combination of one uh, 
N3, N330 and a combination of this N330 with the recycled camo black. Here there is a mistake that the first is not recycled carbon black, it's, it's commercial and, and virgin carbon black. Okay. So uh, we convert those combinations uh, with one uh, master batch commercially available that was delivered by one big player. And that, that, that's the, the conditions of our experimental design. Uh, when, we diff, when we tune the different mixing energy, you know that mixing energy is very important when you try to disperse very complicated uh, substances like, like this, uh, which is carbon black with low, high, uh, low and medium production and screw speed, you can have different uh, specifical mechanical energy, which is related with shear and also with dispersion. And that's what we obtain. Here we made the trials in both film, and here uh, and you can see uh, down the, this, this uh, specimen, you will see the different uh, formulas. And, and uh, what we did is some, first of all, we did some visual analysis and we can see um, besides processing that was perfect, we obtained very nice films. And here you can see that it's quite complicated to find the difference between of them. Okay, so that that gives you that gives us a good idea of of, uh, of how good were the three compounds that we were comparing. We we mixed at one percent and we obtained sixty micron films. And okay, as I mentioned, processing condition were the typical ones, not, just not to go too much into detail. And no significant, no significant differences were detected over the solid carbon black and conventional carbon black master bud dilution. So if they work properly, and at the same, we did the same with injection molding. We obtained different specimens. In this case, we obtained these plates uh, by injection molding, uh, which are, which were uh, we want to do uh, on to obtain big specimens just to see if we can find difference in the surface and so on. As you can see, it's quite complicated to find a difference between any of them. So it means that the dispersion has been very good in all of them and, uh, and the processing was good, no problems, no difference in processing. So they behave in the same way. And at the end, what we did, because here we, I said, okay, they are very similar. So the properties are more, would be more or less the same. We measure and we did colorimetry, so to, 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 to assess that we that we are having a good uh, good impressions. So what we did here is we, we did colorimetry, and uh, and the issue is that when you when you do colorimetry, uh, you you measure the coordinates uh, L A B, and, and and to check how far are you from a color, you calculate delta E. And here in the right side, you can see that delta E is below one. Normally, in the table down, you can see that depending on, on the value of delta E, you are going to have some deviation with the, with the color. Uh, if we have values between zero and one, it means that it's almost uh, impossible that you can find any difference in color between any of the specimens. So the impressions that we have at the first glance were confirmed by the measurements of color. So it means that we reach a good uh, dispersion of carbon black and we can replace different types of carbon black for coloring. Other issue will be if we can find the same performance in UV protection or uh, in antistatic properties and so on. This is something that can be studied. But in principle, at least in color, we obtain very good uh, uh, performance. And for finishing, uh, I have put something that we are starting to, to study nowadays, and uh, it's how to obtain uh, the vulcanization of end of life tiles for different methods. Okay, as you as you have seen in the presentation, we have a lot of expertise working with thin screw extrusion, and that's one thing that we want to start to to uh, to work with. Uh, we want to explore different methodologies to break. Uh, the cross-linking structure of the of the of the food bones, okay. And one of them is the use of very high shear configurations of thin screw extrusion, and uh, and the other is mechanical energy. And also we can uh, combine this with the organization agents in order to enhance this, and also it can combine with supercritical CO two in order to, to lower 
uh, the, 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 the heat generated by this amount of, of shear. Also, we can integrate uh, into an extruder. extruder. Uh, I think that probably you know this technique, but we want to explore it. Uh, ultrasounds aid extrusion. Where ultrasounds and uh, high, uh, high energy ultrasounds can be applied to the molten polymer in, within the twin screw extruder in order to break this, uh, this sulfur bond. So uh, I think that from my side, uh, of course, both processes are not industrial, industrially or commercially available, so they need to be optimized and they need to be, uh, let's say, um, I studied much more in detail because uh, you need to, to define very well your extruders, you need to adapt and so on. So that's where we are going to start working uh, in the next in the next future. So that's everything from uh, from my side. Now I'm going to, to hand uh, over the presentation to my colleague uh, Nora. And uh, as Agustina has said, if you have any questions, we will answer in at the end of the of the presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, this is Nora Lardies, and as Luis has already said, I'm happy to be here sharing with, with you this, this information. Okay, now uh, from the chemical uh, point of view, I'm going to, uh, to explain to you uh, these uh, uh, thermal, thermal processes, which is pyrolysis, gasification and combustion, that uh, that's the, the main uh, chemical recycling for ELT. And then I will share uh, the last slide that will be the vulcanization. Okay, I'm going to, to focus on pyrolysis, okay, because I think it's the, more, the most interesting one. Uh, we can achieve a valuable, val valuable products. And I'm going to start with that one. Okay, a pyrolysis process is a thermal decomposition process at 400 uh, degrees in an oxygen-free em environment and uh, is uh, economically beneficial as it converts waste tires into valuable products. Uh, and uh, the main problem is the uh, environmental impact, but compared to uh, combustion and gasification, the impact uh, to the em em environment is less. Here you can see a, a picture, which is a, a, to a recycling of composites, but it's uh, with a size is more or less the same. And you can see here, you put here the, the tires, and then uh, you achieve here the temperature, you get the solid waste, over here, and in this way, you get the gas that goes to the condenser. You get here the pyrolysis oil, and then you go through this way for the pyrolysis gas. Okay, here you have like a recirculation. This is a filter, and the gas that comes over here go again to the to the burner to the pyrolysis. Okay. Then uh, the three uh, pyrolysis products that we obtain from uh, waste tires are uh, the pyrolysis oil, pyrochar, and pyrogas. The pyrolysis oil, or we are going to, to name from that uh, TPO, uh, you achieve around 40 to 60 percent. It's a, a chemically very complex mixture. Mainly, it contains uh, aromatic, aliphatic, heteroatom, and polar fractions. Uh, the second one is the, the pyrochar. You achieve between 30 and 40 percent, and has a very high carbon content, which, uh, which can be a low cost and waste precursor to synthesize a uh, porous activated uh, carbon material, or as, or as Luis has said before, uh, carbon black. And the third one is pyrogas, that you achieve between 5 to 20 percent. 
and uh, the, this uh, gas fraction uh, has non-condensable gases, mainly uh, like hydrogen. Okay, here you can see a, a schematic picture uh, of the of the product, the products that I have already said, also the steel wire and the uh, and the, the applications for each product. So the uh, from the TPO uh, we can achieve carbon nanomaterials and fuel and chemicals from a pyrochar. Uh, supercapacitors and batteries due to the energy storage capacity and uh, even an application for wastewater treatment due to the absorption uh, property. And the, from the pyrogas, uh, um, you provide the required energy for the pyrolysis process. Okay, uh, talking about the, the pyrolysis process itself, uh, these pyrolysis products are affected by the process con conditions, mainly the pyrolysis temperature, the heating rate, the pressure, and the catalyst. So, as regards uh, the temperature, uh, I think that I have already said that uh, pyrolysis temperatures uh, were between 400 and 600 degrees. The low temperature pyrolysis process favors uh, the production of TPO, the oils, and uh, the optimum temperature range goes from uh, 200 to 250 uh, for the increase uh, TPO jet. And the high temperature process favors the production of uh, gases. Sorry. As already has said, Luis, this is very. Okay, this one. So, uh, the impact of the uh, heating rate and the pressure. Is this one a low heating rate of one degree uh, per minute can be used to increase the yield of solid char. High heating rate uh, indicate a decrease in TPO and increase in gas gel. As you can see there, uh, for a, a pyrolysis temperature of 720 degrees, you can achieve up five degrees per minute, 6.6 .6 percentage of gas and at 80 uh, degrees per minute, you can achieve uh, close to a 15 uh, percentage of gas. And the vacuum pyrolysis process uh, resulted in higher oil gel than the oil gel from an atmospheric pyrolysis process. And uh, in this case, in vacuum, the gels of gas and pyrochar uh, were lower. Okay, this is the, the impact of catalyst on the pyrolysis process. The presence of catalyst during the pyrolysis changes the output product composition. So, uh, if we use a catalysis, uh, usually uh, that resulted in cracking down the heavy hydrocarbons into lower molecular weight uh, pyrolytic oils. And uh, the catalyst favors the gas gel and reduce the TPO, that increasing the light oil uh, fraction. And uh, there are no changes in the char yield offset. So that uh, here you can see some examples of catalysts. And uh, for example, the, the calcium hydroxide reduce the sulfur content of the liquid oil. Okay, until here uh, we have seen the, the, how the uh, performance of the pyrolysis affect the, the products. And now we are going to see the applications of West uh, Chaya pyrolysis products. Starting with the, with the TPO, the, the pyrolysis oil, okay, we can, uh, we can have fuel 
and chemicals and carbon nanomaterials. Starting for fuel and chemicals, uh, okay, I have already said that TPO contains a, a very interesting and valuable uh, chemicals, like for example, benzene, toluene, xylene, limolene, and styrene, which uh, can be used in the uh, and are already used in the chemical industry as feedstock. TPO, however, is not appropriate for direct use in the combustion process due to its high sulfur content. Uh, because during the combustion, uh, the sulfur in the fuel for sulfur oxidize and uh, that uh, products are very corrosive. Then it's necessary uh, to make a post uh, treatment in order to distill uh, with uh, formic acid and uh, oxygenated water uh, to remove uh, close to 70% of the sulfur. And a TPO can be used directly as fuel in boilers, okay, added to petroleum refinery stocks. Okay, uh, the second applications are uh, carbon nanomaterials. Okay, for example, uh, carbon nanotubes have a uh, very good electrical, thermal, and mechanical properties. They are uh, very well known, and uh, they have applications in a lot of sectors, for example, in nanoelectronics, sensors, in battery, solar cells, supercapacitors, emission in medical, conductive inks. And nowadays, uh, low-cost uh, carbon nanotubes can be synthesized on a large scale from uh, petroleum-based precursors such as uh, benzene, xylene, and hexane, which are not sustainable due to an unstable uh, supply of oil resources. Uh, that's why it's advisable to choose a hydrocarbon precursor as starting materials from unconventional and uh, waste material, like Calvi tiles, which is in this case, or for example, plastic. And then uh, it has already been, been uh, synthesized of multi wall carbon nanotubes from a low boiling point hydrocarbon, EPO, derived from, of course, from waste char material, mixed with ferrocene and using a quartz substrate as a catalyst. Okay, we have seen the application of a TPO, and now we are going to see the application for a pyrochar. Uh, we will use the uh, capacity as energy storage to, uh, to use uh, in supercapacitors and batteries applications and the absorption uh, capability to uh, wastewater treatments. Okay, then uh, <clears throat> uh, the, regarding the supercapacitors and batteries, the, uh, the pyrocharge has the property of energy storage and the advantage as, uh, uh, as energy storage is high surface area porosity, high electrical uh, conductivity, and the localized P electrons. Okay, uh, so there are few reports which started the application of, uh, of uh, biochar as electrons in energy storage systems. Um, and some examples are, for example, pyrochar treated with sulfuric acid uh, were used in sodium ion batteries and pyrochar uh, treated with uh, potassium hydroxide that has been used for lithium ion battery with nearly 80% uh, of capacity retention after 100 cycles, which, are, uh, which is very good. Okay, the second application of pyrochar is uh, as wastewater uh, treatment. Okay, so uh, the preparation of absorbent material from pyrochar with a postchemical activation process, okay, is applied to the absorptive uh, removal of uh, cadmium and uh, lead in the domestic water samples. And uh, another study uh, has seen the, a, compar a comparison 
of the commercial methylene blue absorbent and acid treated child activated carbon. And they found that acid treated child activated carbon has absorption capability higher than the commercial activated carbon. Okay. Okay, and the application for uh, the, the third fraction of pyrolysis, that is the pyrogas, uh, is mainly to uh, combustible fuel, okay? Because we ha I have already said that the main, uh, the main gas in this fraction is hydrogen. Okay, so uh, from this fraction we can provide the, uh, the required energy for the pyrolysis process. The gross heating value of the pyrolysis gas is 2,900 joules per gram, and the enthalpy of pyrolysis was around uh, 270 uh, joules per gram, expressed as energy per rubber child unit mass. So uh, the gas phase products in pyrogas are, as I said, uh, mainly hydrogen, and also a mixture of olefins, carbon oxides, and a small amount of sulfur and nitrogen compounds. So uh, hydrogen is a very valuable uh, gas. It's used in ammonia synthesis, and uh, it is an efficient and, environmental, and environmentally friendly fuel over fossil fuels, okay? Because it has high energy density, carbon-free energy, and zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, the hydrogen uh, is uh, currently mostly produced from fossil fuels, okay. while its production from waste child materials will be a novel route to recycle waste tires and get a valuable uh, added product. Okay, uh, we have seen the uh, pyrolysis uh, recycling uh, technology. And now uh, we will see gasification and combustion. Here in this diagram, we can see that uh, pyrolysis uh, is a, a temperature process with no oxygen. Gasification has a limited amount of oxygen and combustion has more than 100% of oxygen. So in gasification, uh, well, it's, a, it's a thermal degradation at low oxygen atmosphere and a temperature about 600 degrees, more than pyrolysis. Uh, the result is uh, two, two products, a synthesis gas or syn gas, mainly with hydrogen, which is around 63% uh, in weight. And the second one is a solid phase, which is 37%. And the gel gasification process varies depending on the technology. Uh, the technology, fuel, and, and gasifying uh, agent used. And regarding the combustion, okay, uh, that uh, uses uh, waste tire as fuels in incinerators. So the advantages are a reduced power production cost, a maximum heat recovery, and the main disadvantages are uh, no material recovery, as as we recovered before uh, uh, in, in the oil fraction, high capital investment, necessity of flue gas cleaning in order to come to the atmosphere, responsible for carbon footprints and high operating costs. Okay, and now the last, the last slide is regarding the vulcanization, which is uh, a chemical recycling method. Uh, this one is a, is a process of the, of the composition that allows the recycling of rubber from ELTs based on, on a chemical bond breaking, uh, carbon sulfur and sulfur sulfur bonds, uh, without breaking the backbone network and without degrading the material. Okay. The devulcanized rubber uh, can be mixed with virgin rubber or with other kind of matrices to give new compounds uh, without usually uh, a significant decrease in mechanical and physical properties. It can be done by different processes like chemical, ultrasound, microwave, thermomechanical. And the main advantage is that allows the, the reutilization of the ELT components. Uh, the problem is that it's an expensive technology 
properties of the recycled rubber are not as good as the virgin rubber. And uh, it's important to take in, in, into account an optimal selection of the raw materials and process conditions. Okay, so as a, as a conclusion, okay, we can say that ELT can be considered as a consistent source for raw materials, as we have seen. Uh, thermoplastics can be successfully modified with byproducts of tire recycling. And, uh, adaptive twin screw extrusion can be considered as effective technique for tire and tire components recycling. Uh, pyrolysis is a good ELT technique, uh, recycling technique, technique as combines energy recovery and inst interesting subproducts applications. And uh, the vulcanization of ELT recovers recycled rubber that can be incorporated with new virgin rubber in order to for new applications. And okay, thank you very much for your attention. And Luis and me will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Luis for your presentation. We received some questions I would like to share with you. Does carbon back from pyrolysis of enzyme tires usually require more refining for being useful? Uh, can, can, can you repeat the, quest, the, the question, uh, Martin? Uh, Agustin, I was moving to the, to the screen. Uh, can you repeat this? Sure, no problem. Does carbon black from pyrolysis of end of life tires usually require more refinement before being useful? Okay, um, to be honest, uh, we have not been so much worried uh, about this issue because uh, this work. We, we, we receive the, the, the recycling type of black from, uh, from the company that was recycling, and that, uh, in, that, uh, in that case was Pyronix. So I cannot tell you if uh, after doing that, you need to different purification stages and so on. I, I don't know, probably yes, probably yes, but I cannot detail you what type of operation I was much worried about, how to put in the plastic in the right way. But for sure, I think that uh, Probably they would have uh, treatments that, uh, to be honest, I think that could be a little bit uh, secret or something like that. Thank you, Luis. We have more questions. It has been mentioned that tire pyrolysis has an environmental impact drawback. Could you please elaborate on the specific environmental hazards of tire pyrolysis? Okay, regarding uh, the main uh, the main for, uh, problem for the environmental, it will be the energy that you need in order to to heat the the furnace. Okay, and uh, you must be very careful as well with the gases. Okay, with the gases. Because some gases uh, you can use again for the to feed the furnace. Another uh, you and then uh, you can uh, uh, besides re, uh, re, uh, recover that gases in order to get fuel. And uh, also it depends of the capacity of the pyrolysis. Some gases uh, need to be um, flow to the atmosphere. And for that gases, you need to clean them, okay? But it's mainly because of that, because of the gases that you can um, that you can uh, uh, throw to the atmosphere, and uh, from the point of view of the uh, of the energy that you need to 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 heat the furnace, okay? But it's not as bad. Uh, pyrolysis is much better than gasification and combustion, of course. Thank you, Nora. Next question for Luis. 
What is the rubber size particles used in elastomeric compounds? Is there any size requirement? Okay, uh, I, I used to say that the, 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 the smaller particle, the better properties that you are going to obtain because you are going to uh, have much more. In the case that you have good chemical compatibility, you will have much more um, release of or, 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 or yield of these properties. But at that point, uh, I think that we were working with particles that were about uh, half a millimeter or something like that, more or less. More or less. I always want to work with particles that could be behind uh, or below 100 uh, microns in, in that point. But you know that when, when we go to those uh, particle size, you, do, you need to do pre-milling, and this is much more expensive. Um, we don't want or we don't go to, um, to thinner particles because the application uh, didn't, didn't need uh, such, uh, such properties because we have a very thick part. The thinner part that you are going to obtain, the most or the more smaller particle size for the thing that you are going to add to, to plastics. Thank you, Luis. Next question. Did I last carry out some R&D work on the use of recovered carbon packing batteries? Uh, well, I'm, I'm working by memory. Uh, we work with uh, carbon black for batteries, but not with recycled carbon. Uh, yeah, we did works to make. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Let me let me. Uh, is we did a uh, different works in. Um, I don't know the name. I, I'm looking for the right word in English, but <laughs> it not came to my mind. Uh, plates. Um, 12, 12, uh, 12 cell plates. Uh, when we need, when you need to add very high amount of uh, of uh, fillers that are conducted, uh, but uh, we use conventional carbon black graphite and carbon nanotubes, but not recycled carbon black. Thank you, Luis. Next question: What is it required to be done to the carbon black? In order to upgrade it for industrial industrial use. Well, uh, I think that first of all, uh, it, 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 it's it's an issue of how this carbon black is delivered. I think that a normally pyrolysis carbon black is delivered in some shape that you can it's some shape of granules, and uh, and uh, it makes that you can handle very well. You know that carbon black is has a very low wood density, so it makes it complicated to to work with. Uh, it means that it's also hard to disperse, but in that case, uh, recycled carbon black has to be broken. I mean, uh, you have some particle size that most of times is of the same range of the gaps that you have in your extruder. So you have to break it in the process of extrusion. If you do it in some bamboo mixture, you probably are going to obtain better dispersions because you have much more intensive mixing. But in terms of uh, introducing in much, in much, in more way, the range of materials, you can work in thin screw extrusion, and then you are not working only with, with rubber materials. So you need the thinner particle size, as I said before, is very important. So if it, if it, if this particle size can be downsized from the things that at least I'm working with, it will be much more uh, advantage. We, we will have better properties. Here we we didn't measure mechanical properties, to be honest, and I think that probably. With the conventional carbon black, we will have uh, better properties in terms of mechanical. And uh, other uh, other issues interesting uh, could be to know the degree of, of impurities that we can have uh, in carbon black. I don't I don't know the degrees of impurities that those carbon black have. So uh, these impurities can also generate uh, different volatiles and things that can uh, lower the, the final property. And another issue would be the cost. Uh, when I made all the presentations with the carbon black, um, people say, "Okay, wow, very nice results," but the cost of carbon black is is not, uh, let's say, so far affordable. At that point, uh, what we did in this work is, is, if you remember, is to combine uh, commercial carbon black with recycled one. So then you use this as some extender. And maybe you can introduce some fraction of recycled carbon black in order to have much more competitive prices. 
Thank you, Luis. Next question. Could you please try to explain how the volcanization is made? In my opinion, the process of volcanizing rubber is an irreversible process and can therefore not be brought back to its origin. Okay, it's yeah, it's done with, uh, with chemicals. Okay, now uh, there are some research about about that in order to improve the the conditions uh, to improve the the gel. Okay, but as I said. Uh, from my point of view, pyrolysis is the best uh, recycling uh, way to for tires, and uh, you can uh, achieve. It depends on the condition of the, vulcan the vulcanization. You achieve a different grades of of, uh, of the rubber, okay? And uh, then is is a question of, of check the properties and check. Uh, the percentage in order to uh, to mix with uh, virgin rubber, okay, and I'll see the the applications uh, for that. It's not vulcanization. It's more is not irreversible as you, as you can uh, break the the carbon sulfur and sulfur sulfur bonds, okay. But it's difficult to achieve the 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 virgin properties of the of the rubber. There are processes that, that you have different approaches, and uh, and, uh, and Nora showed in the last slide. I think you can have some mechanical, you can have uh, assisted by other type of source of energies uh, that can excite uh, different bonds in order to, to break those bonds. So you have microwave, you have uh, ultrasound, you have thermomechanical, and also you have chemical assist. Uh, the issue is. Uh, we are going to take something that can be controlled in molecular weight and something like that, very similar to the raw materials that we have prior to, to, to vulcanization. It is complicated because you have something that is controlled in a process of, the vulc of vulcanization, well studied, and here you are going to break everything as you can. So uh, you need to find uh, or you need to be a little bit, uh, you need to understand the process in order to check that. You obtain something, and we will see afterwards what we can do. Because, as you can imagine, control a process when you have microwave or control a process when you have uh, ultrasounds, uh, it's complicated. But anyway, it's a process of generating enough energy to break those bonds, and this is possible. Other issue would be how economically uh, and, and how feasible it is, because those techniques have to be upscale. Uh, at, at, at big facilities in order to, to, to have uh, good profitability. But in, in principle, those, those te techniques are, are, are already in the, in the state of the art and have demonstrated that they work. And also, it's, it's important the, how the raw material is. I mean, it's not the same if you start from a very degraded tire or it's not very degraded. Then uh, you have taken into account the raw material and also the, the conditions uh, that you made for the devulcanization process. So, uh, in that case, you will achieve different different things. It's important to characterize and, as we said, let's see what you can do with that. Okay, but it depends of the of the of the conditions, the process, as we said, and the and the raw the raw material, the tire, the initial tire. Thank you, Nora, and, and Luis. Next question for Luis. Uh, regarding the textile fiber recycling, as I know, a mixture of nylon, polyester, and others are used in tires. You are using considering, you are considering only nylon. Is there any limitation when you do the chain extension, filtering, and the volatilization? Yeah, uh, 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 it's very very complete question. Uh, okay, in terms of polyester, I, I mentioned nylon, of course, there is a combination of uh, fabrics depending on the type of the tire. Uh, and also polyester, this polyester, which is uh, PET, uh, can be chain extended. I mean, if you have chain extension and you have a mix of both uh, fabrics and you have a chain extender, this chain extender, uh, as you know, when you are mixing two plastics, you have most of times incompatibilities. So, 
when you use a chain extender at the same time that you are enlarging the molecular weight, you also are having some kind of reactive compatibilization. And the thing that you are going to obtain uh, probably will have very decent uh, properties. Okay, when we talk about different processes in one same, uh, let's say, operation, which is thin screw extrusion, you need to find the balance between everything. I mean, if you want to be much more effective in the volatilization, probably you are going to have less production or you are going to have less yield. So you need to find this balance in terms of, uh, and, and what could be the most important thing? I mean, imagine that you have a lot of volatiles, so you will put much more attention on volatiles. And then you will uh, focus the 60% uh, of the effectiveness of the process in the volatilization. It will modify the processing conditions that can affect other issues like filtering and uh, and uh, and, uh, and chain extension. So uh, at the end, is what Nora said. It depends on the raw material and depends on how it arrives to you. When you have something that is very a lot of volatiles, a lot of ground, uh, say particles of, of, of rubber. And, uh, and very degraded textile, so you are going to have a problem in terms that probably you are going to reach a mark of six on the final quality. It's just I'm just wondering. Eh? Uh, uh, but if you have, uh, um, if you are more affected by uh, contamination, so you will put attention on filtering and so on. You need to find what could be uh, the the most important operation that you want to to, to, to boost, and also to find a compromise between the other ones. That of course. A good question, and, uh, and you have to take into account everything. Thank you, Luis. Next question Can't the hydrogen produced be reused to produce the energy needed for the pyrolysis process? Yes, as, uh, yes, as I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an application. Okay? as the, the boundaries of the pyrolysis, okay? The gas that you get mainly has hydrogen and it can be used as, um, for example, in the synthesis of ammonia or uh, usually is used in order to, uh, so you can, as you have seen in the, in the first uh, picture of the pyrolysis, uh, the gas, you can uh, go directly to the to the furnace, okay, in order to to hit the to hit the pyrolysis. And also, you can get fuel uh, to get uh, to get uh, combustible. Thank you, Nora. Next question: Are you working in all the topics you mentioned in the chemical recycling approach you presented? If so, did you evaluate the devulcanization efficiency or is this just a reclaiming processes where you cannot be very selective with the break of the sulfur bonds? Okay, regarding the, the, the pyrolysis, uh, we have here a, a pyrolysis plant of five liters, okay? And we could do that uh, research, but we haven't done yet. Okay, because the pyrolysis is, is quite new here and also we have the capabilities, uh, we haven't uh, recycled uh, waste tires uh, yet. And regarding the, the vulcanization, uh, the same, we, uh, in I plus, uh, now we are starting with that, uh, with this methodology. Uh, we have recycled um, uh, another kind of plastics like polyurethanes, chemical recycling of polyurethanes, of uh, composites, but not yet uh, regarding uh, waste tires. Okay, but we have the, the capabilities to do it. And also, as I mentioned before, this is some line that we want to run uh, in, uh, in the next month, because I think that we need to explore continuous processes like finish construction and the different between uh, also, uh, between the processes that uh, Nora mentioned, you have uh, discrete uh, processes. So, with twin screw extrusion, we can do something continuously, which is interesting. And, uh, and uh, from the point of view of, uh, of cleaning and so on, it's much more uh, convenient. So, 
this is something that we will uh, uh, run shortly. Thank you. Next question. Middle Eastern countries have oil. The process of extracting oil from tires will be economical. How to take advantage of damaged tires? Sorry, I don't, I don't know if somebody with the question. Can you, can you repeat it? Sure, Nora. Middle Eastern countries have oil. The process of extracting oil from the tires will be economical. How to take advantage of damaged tires? Okay, as I say, from, from pyrolysis, you can get the, the, the oil fraction. Okay, and you can get uh, from, from that one uh, uh, hydrocarbons that you can use for fuel. I don't know if I'm asking the question. Thanks, Nora. Okay. Next question. With applications for tire rubber powder derived TPEs, you believe can be commercialized on a large scale. In other words, do you know examples of products which are already produced from tire derived TPEs on a commercial scale? I don't know if I, if I got you. Are you meaning that uh, doing the bonds with TPE mixed with uh, rubbery, uh, with rubber powders and things like that? Maybe yes. It's, it's, okay, perfect. Uh, so far, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know if. Uh, if in the market we have something that could be like that, probably uh, the, the thing is that our companies that will uh, will order those compounds to different compounders in order to produce products. But something that you have market available so far, from my knowledge, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know. If they exist, I don't know. But the point is that I mentioned before, when we develop different projects for doing uh, different uh, uh, urban uh, furniture and things like that that were made with uh, with ground uh, uh, rubber. We did something for companies that afterwards were, were much, uh, let's say, focused on finding the, the providers and doing the components and afterwards to obtain the final product. Something that was, in other words, private, not, not commercial available from the point of view of raw materials. But for sure, they were. Hello? Agustina? Apologize, my microphone was, uh, was not working. So I would like to thank you, thank you, Luis and Nora for your presentation. And thank you everybody for taking part in this session. We would very much appreciate if you could help us keep our service relevant by giving us your feedback. We will send a few questions by email soon, together with the presentation that was shown during the conference. If you want to learn more about these topics, please kindly note that we are issuing a free tire recycling related newsletter once a month. Also, in our Bible Academy section, you will find a wide variety of articles that highlight the different aspects of managing this business. If you have any questions related to the webinar session or our consulting services, please do not hesitate to contact us directly. Thank you very much and have a nice day.